coming out. Um, yeah, like she said, I'll be talking about DNS-based authentication by named entities, how it interacts with the CA system, and uh, see if we can't fix some things. Um, just out of curiosity, uh, who here has heard of DNSSEC? So nice, pretty good size. And what about Dane? Yeah, a lot less. All right, great. Well, this is gonna be a good, good starting point. So, uh, who am I? I'm Tony Cargyle. Uh, I'm a security engineer at ISEC Partners. Uh, I get to carry out a lot of application infrastructure and pen tests, uh, anything ranging from white box to black box, uh, mobile infrastructure, web app, you name it. Before that, I, was work, uh, I went to school at uh, UT in Austin uh, with a degree in computer science. And before that, I was programming in web application and configuration management environments. So what am we going to be talking today? Well, I'd love to just start, jump right into Dane, but unfortunately you can't really do that with a good primer in DNSSEC, and you can't talk about DNSSEC without the problems of DNS. So, and then after that, we're going to talk about, you know, why do, what's, what's the purpose of Dane, what's it fixed, why is it there? Um, for those people playing uh, security bingo, I'll talk about Heartbleed, and then we'll end up uh, talking about some potential issues with Dane. So, what is DNS, Domain Name System? Well, hopefully this is a refresher for most of you, otherwise this talk might uh, not go so well. But um, DNS is basically just a way for us to resolve www.bank.com into an IP address. A uh, client sends a request out with an A record type um, and gets a response back with an IP. Um, so what's, what's some of the problems with DNS? Well, it's old. Uh, Bind was created in 1984. Sadly enough, that was before I was born. Um, uh, the RFCs finally got ratified in 1987. So back, back in that time, security was a blimp on the radar. No one was really worried about DNS spoofing, cache poisoning, or any, really, any of the um, issues that we're having to deal with nowadays. So let's talk about the first issue with uh, DNS, and that is that it provides no integrity, no confidentiality, no availability. So it's pretty trivial to spoof DNS. So say a hacker gets in the middle of a client making a request to the DNS, uh, or to a website, making the DNS request. If we can intercept that, we can just simply reply back with the uh, IP of our malicious fake site, and the uh, client simply goes there. There's no guarantee that that information that that client is receiving is uh, legitimate information. So the second issue is DNS cache poisoning. And this is a little bit more sophisticated of an attack. Uh, what this is doing is instead of um, just replying back to the client saying that our, um, the legitimate site's IP is actually our malicious IP, we're actually sending a response back to a caching server. And then that caching server is then going to send that response back to anybody that asks that server. So, um, what this is, is going to do is our, our attacker is going to send a request to the DNS caching server, then it's going to spoof a response back saying that, oh, uh, www.bank.com is actually 1337, and then now anybody who sends a, a DNS request that goes through that caching server, well, now it's going to respond back with that 1337 for as long as that TTL of um, that packet. So uh, originally, it was pretty trivial to do this. Um, all you really had to do was uh, match the query ID of uh, the DNS request to spoof a DNS response. So and that uh, query ID is only a two-byte um, uh, identifier that uh, you could just trivial brute force. Um, so the original solution was to just make the TTL extremely low. Uh, but that really wasn't an, uh, a solution when Dan Kaminsky came along and showed in 2008 that uh, he could just um, use a bunch of different subdomains, just brute force subdomains, randomized subdomains, and he just got around that TTL. And uh, that was an issue for a while. Finally, the, the real issue was port randomization. Basically, when a request goes out, it actually um, goes out on a random port, not on port 53. So you can't just... Um, send a, a forged response to that port. You have to also guess the port 
and the query ID now, which um, gains a ton of entropy. It's a lot harder to brute force, but it's really not a perfect solution. If you can, if you can get lucky, then you can still do ca DNS cache poisoning. So then there's some other issues with DNS. Um, there's really no uh, validity checking. So um, isecpartners.com, um, you can actually you know, register a domain of one secpartners.com. Um, you don't have that same uh, validity checking that you would if you say went to um, get an SSL certificate for one secpartners.com. Hopefully you get denied, but we'll see later on that that's not usually the case. And then also, of course, we're relying on DNS, so um, DNS servers are another issue. There's been some uh, compromises in DNS protocols, so uh, that's always uh, something we need to take care of. So now that we've talked about kind of the issues with DNS, we'll jump into DNSSEC. And this was really created just to answer the problem of, of you know, DNS not having any security by default. So uh, what is DNSSEC? DNSSEC provides uh, origin authentication of DNS data. Uh, it uh, provides authenticated denial of existence, and it provides data integrity. Uh, notably, it does not provide two things, availability and confidentiality. So we're going to um, go ahead and talk about how it does this. It's kind of a bold statement to just say, you know, complete data integrity, complete origin authentication. Um, but we're, we're going to show how it does this. So first of all, it adds a few record types. So it adds um, this RRSIG record type, which is going to hold the signature for um, every record in um, the DNS zone. Um, it's also going to hold a DNS key, which is going to be the public key for the signature. It's going to have um, NSEC, which I'm going to go into a little bit later about uh, for use for uh, denial of existence and um, then you use your delegation server. So I'm going to go over these a little bit more in depth in, in a few minutes because uh, this is really important for Dane. But what, it, what this essentially does is you have a, 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 a zone which you have each record type in that zone. You're going to make a, uh, you're going to sign that zone with your key signing key, uh, um, pardon me, your zone signing key and that entail will uh, be provided to, in, that signature will be provided to anybody that makes a request out to, say, an A record. You're going to get an associated RRSIG record with that. Um, and then uh, the public key for that will be in, stored in the DNS key. And then to provide a chain of trust, we also use a delegation signer, a DS record type, um, to, to specify our parent domain. Um, so this might be a little bit confusing. This might clear it up a little bit. So what we're doing right now is say, we're at, um, uh, we're looking to sign uh, www.mybank.com. Well, uh, mybank.dom will sign that certificate using its uh, public key, private key pair. And then when it does that, it'll publish the, its public key also to the .com, dot, dot .dom domain. And this domain uh, will hold that DNS key and it will in turn sign that key with its private key. And then, um, publish its public key, and also push it to the root domain. And that's where this entire chain of trust lies, is in the root domain. So we would pin on the public key for the root domain. Um, so let's just go ahead and jump into what this actually looks like um, tangibly. So this might be a little bit small for the people in the back, but um, this is just going to be a Wireshark capture of a request sent out. So um, it's pretty simple. We just have a uh, type A record request to good.dane.verisignlabs.com. Um, looks like a normal A request. There's just one um, flag that's been changed uh, that says it's DNSSEC um, um, approved or um, cap capable. So then when we send this, this request out, we get a response back that uh, looks similar to this. So one, we get a re response back with our type A um, address, uh, just like we would normally see if we send a, a request out. But then we also get this RRSIG back, which I said was a signature for that uh, type A response. So in here, um, it specifies a few things. It specifies the algorithm that we used. Um, it also specifies the signature, of course, and um, the signer's name. So that uh, now, when a DNSSEC 
uh, client wants to verify this, they can then go look at uh, good.data.verisignlab.com uh, DNS key, and then they can perform a chain of trust command to make sure that the request that they just received, that type A record, is actually coming from the server, it hasn't been modified, um, and uh, it's actually there. So, um, hopefully that was just kind of a refresher, but uh, so there's some issues with DNSSEC, right? But there's, they also provide some really good things. Like I said, it provides authorization and an integrity. So, no more spoofing, no more cache poisoning, which is a huge benefit. Like I said, it's still an issue that we're having to deal with right now. Um, notably, though, it doesn't provide confidentiality. So, anybody that's sniffing on that network can, um, will know where you're going. Um, there's some, some other uh, solutions that take care of confidentiality. Uh, if, you wanna, if you're interested in that, take a look at DNS Curve. That's, some, that's a pretty cool solution for, um, for the confidentiality of DNS records, but it's something that's a little bit out of scope for this talk. So how does, this, how does DNSSEC take care of you know, DNS spoofing or DNS caching? Well, any time an attacker is gonna try and man in the middle that uh, DNS connection and modify it, he's not gonna be able to sign that, that RRSIG with his own private key because it wouldn't match up with the DNS key that's on the, um, the fake site, or uh, sorry, on the, um, the legitimate site's DNS server. So uh, if an attacker was to like, man in the middle and give its own, it's the DNSSEC uh, validation would not happen and um, the attack simply fails. So uh, one thing I kind of glossed over, but um, DNSSEC provides um, uh, denial of existence. So if you send a request out to doesnotexist.google.com, it'll actually come back and say, that domain doesn't exist in our zone, and here's proof of that. Um, and it does that by sending back an insect record type. So uh, what does this look like? So um, we send a request out to uh, right, right .net, uh with a, um, a, a domain that doesn't exist. So I think I put e.ripe.net right here. What this actually does is it sends back a request saying that doesn't exist and I can prove it to you because there is, um, in this one it shows there's 256cns.ripe.net and elearning.ripe.net but there's no e.ripe.net. So I don't know if you can kind of already put the pieces together but this allows you to just do simple zone enumeration. So if you were able to just go in and be, be like, all right, is there a.ripe.net? And they're gonna tell you anything between before and after a, and then you can just go down the line and you can figure out all of the domains, the subdomains in that zone. Um, so the answer to that was a modification of the DNS uh, sec RFC, which introduced in sec three. And um, what this does is it just provides hashing before it does any of the checks of the zone. So uh, here we, we, we send in, um, uh, this is actually going to my domain now, e.tonycargyle.com. Now what it does is it hashes that subdomain and then checks against a hashed um, list of my subdomains. So now um, it's saying, okay, uh, you know, DMC blah, 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 dot .tonycargyle doesn't exist. Um, but in you know, the hash before and the hash after it does exist. So what this does is this allows us, like we would now have to crack all the hashes in um, for the zone to be able to enumerate it. So that does provide some security, but this is just a SHA-1 hash. And so a big uh, negative is people are saying that you know, with a big enough computer, you can just go ahead and crack all these, um, all these hashes and you can still do zoom or enumeration on um, DNSSEC uh, proof zones. So, and it's like, well, zone enumeration, what does that really matter? But I've seen some pretty um, creative uses of uh, DNS records, like TXT records that hold passwords in it, or um, you know, information about internal networks inside of zone records. So a DNS um, zone enumeration is a pretty, pretty powerful thing. So another thing, um, when we look at a DNSSEC record response, it's containing a, a pretty sizable hash of that record type. And so when you know, a simple uh, request of an A type with a spoofed um, source IP 
would re result in a response to that IP of a very large um, data chunk. And so we could actually use this to do uh, DNS amplification attacks for uh, DDoS. Um, we've already seen this in the wild a few times of using DNS to do um, amplification. And uh, DNSSEC would just um, make those even more powerful because that's quite a bit of information coming back from a small response. Um, and then finally, like I talked about, there's a chain of trust, right? So we're using the zone signing keys and the key signing keys to um, validate the record. And then we're, we're validating each, um, each step of that chain until it gets to that root zone. And we have to pin on something. So right now we're pinning on the root zone. And um, that's owned by the government. So that's owned by IANA. Um, and so take that as you will. Some people say, well, that's really good things. Other people say they don't trust it. So that's just more of your interpretation of that. Um, and then finally, uh, the, the biggest problem with DNSSEC is the implementation. So uh, you know, DNSSEC RFC has been out for a while. The root zone finally got signed um, on 2010. And uh, the .com zone got signed in March of 2011. So it's been around for a little bit, but uh, as you can see with this graph, um, what we're looking at here is a chart of uh, DNSSEC um, implementation over the entire zone. So this top one's .edu. Um, that one's not um, as complete, but this bottom one, uh, this is uh, the .net and the .com zones, .net being in the blue in the top one. And if you look over there, right now we're peaking on the .net at 0.5% of all .NET domains are actually implementing DNSSEC. And even lower than that, .com right now is at about 0.3% of um, all .com domains are uh, DNSSEC um, approved or, uh, or signed. Um, and a, a pretty funny little site you guys can go check out is uh, DNSSECNameAndShame.com. And it will actually, I don't know if you can see that, but you can, it'll show you the Alexa top 25 and not a single one of those um, signs their records with DNSSEC. Um, you, can, you can just put in name after name after name to the site and it'll, none of them, none of them um, validate DNSSEC. So uh, I'll, I'll go into a little bit of this later of why this is, but um, needless to say, that's a huge negative when we have the security out there, but no one's adopting it. So now that we got a, a good primer on uh, Dane, um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, got a question? I was going to ask, um, does, does it just, does it do um, the same functionality for the in adder .article side of the tree? Um, you know what, I haven't actually uh, checked that. So, um, so I'm asking TPR right here, right? Yeah, yeah. It's totally um, it, my thinking, if I had to guess right now, is that it should, but I haven't actually verified that. If you want to get, get with me after this, I can give you my card. I can go check that real quick and, and let you know. All right, so um, after uh, we got a good brief of uh, DNS second, we can finally start talking about Dane. So what is Dane? Um, Dane is a way of being able to do certificate pinning using DNS records instead of using SSL certs. Or uh, sorry, uh, PKIX certs. So, it's built completely on top of DNSSEC. We use all of the integrity and, and uh, authorization of DNSSEC to um, verify our Dane records. And its goal is pretty simple. It's just take away the reliance on the certificate authority and put that on the DNS server. So um, it does this with uh, one simple record type. So we have a TLSA DNS record type. And what that's going to do is that's going to hold the signature of the SSL cert that you're about to receive from an SSL server. Okay. So um, you can actually check this uh, by just doing a dig for a TLSA record type. And then it uh, goes in a format of underscore the port that's going to be running on dot underscore the pro protocol that's going to be running on uh, dot the domain. So if you wanted to see the certificate that you're going to receive from good.dane.verisignlabs.com, you would just make a TLSA uh, um, request to uh, that URL that's, that's up there. So what does the TLSA record type actually look like? Um, it's actually pretty simple. It's just got three different fields plus the actual signature. 
Um, I'm going to go over these fields, but they're certificate usage, the selector, and the matching type, and then the signature. So um, first of all, what's, the, what's that selector? So we can actually say that we're about to specify a full certificate, or we're going to actually um, specify the sub subject public key info. Um, so we can either pin on the full cert or on that just that simple field. Um, we can use, uh, we can do a one for one match. So the full binary um, certificate will be in that record type, or we can use the SHA-256, SHA-512. And Dane's RFC actually supports um, expanding um, algorithms. But the most interesting field by far is the certificate usage field. So what this, is gonna, what this field specifies is what kind of certificate are we going to be receiving and how are we going to handle the certificate once we do receive it. So um, say we get a signature back for a certificate um, and then we use the certificate usage of zero. Well, this is going to be a CA constraint. So basically, this is saying that we specified the certificate of a PKIX approved, so be in your trusted store, certificate root. So we can say, we don't want to use anybody other than verisignlabs.com for the certificate that you're about to receive. Similarly, um, if you specified one, not only um, does the certificate have to be verified by PKIX, but we're saying that that exact certificate has to be the one that we received from, from the SSL cert. So even if it does verify, like goes through the PKIX checking and it's a legitimate certificate, it's gotta be the one that we specified in that, in that TLSA record type. Um, and then conversely, two and three are similar, but the exact opposite. So we're saying that the, um, the we're gonna, uh, if we specify two, it would be a certificate that, ver that gets verified um, as a trust anchor, but it doesn't have to be verified by uh, public key infrastructure. So we could create an SSL cert that we then sign uh, other certs for, and we could actually use that as our trusted um, uh, CA, basically, without ha using a actual trusted CA. And then finally, three, which we call kind of like cert pinning, is this is a certificate that you're about to receive, and it doesn't have to be validated by PKIX. So um, no, there's no reliance on public key infrastructure when you use certificate usage three. So what does this kind of look like? Um, again, a Wireshark capture of the query. And like I said, you just whenever, so say we're going to make an uh, HTTPS request to good.dane.verisignlabs.com, um, along with like a, a record. Um, request for the IP, then we would send a TLSA request um, to underscore 443 dot underscore TCP dot the domain. Um, and then what do you get in the response? Well, like I said, you get um, a few things. So you get the certificate usage, the matching type, and the selector, as well as the signature. So this right here, that 03, the thing that's highlighted, that's the actual SHA-256 of a record that you're about to receive from that HTTPS server. Um, and then you'll notice also along with that, um, you've got uh, the verisignlabs.com uh, RR SIG. So this, is, this TLSA record was just uh, validated using DNSSEC. So how does this stop um, you know, an SSL man in the middle? Um, you know, the, what this does is now, even if um, a SSL cert was compromised, we can now say through DNSSEC, we can verify that the certificate that was specified in that DNS request has to be the one that you're going to receive. Uh, you can't use any other uh, uh, certificates as long as that client is validating on Dane. Um, so why am I kind of talking about Dane? Uh, like, what's the need for Dane? Um, and there's, there's a few problems with uh, the CA system, um, but first I'm going to just start off with a couple of examples that I think really highlights the problem. The first example is uh, DigiNoter. Um, in July of 2011, um, an attacker was able to uh, compromise DigiNoter and was able to create wildcard certificates for, a for anybody. So they created it for Google, um, and then they used that to man the middle um, Gmail for about 300,000 Iranian users. And then uh, during that time, they were also creating wildcards for Yahoo, Mozilla, WordPress, 
um, and in uh, numerous other sites. So no, notice these dates. In July of, of, tw of uh, 2011, this happened. In August 29th of that year, Microsoft finally revoked that certificate uh, using CRL. Another example, Di uh, DigiCert Malaysia, not to be confused with DigiCert, uh, the US uh, provider, two separate entities. Um, they were an intermediary CA for interest. Um, and on November 3rd, they started releasing uh, really poor quality certificates. So there were like five 12-bit RSA keys. Um, they didn't have um, a lot of the, the things that are required by SSL certs. And they were giving them to the Malaysian government. And, um, and the, the, it was realized on November 3rd, Mozilla finally used uh, revocation um, on November 17th, so about two weeks before they were able to actually even uh, push out um, the, the, re the revocation. So what do these two events um, kind of signify? Well, one, a compromise in the chain completely compromises the entire chain of trust. Um, you know, if, if DigiSearch compromised, then not only is this, the um, SSL search that DigiCert has already signed compromised, but the entire system is compromised because they're a root CA. We've, we've completely trusted them for the security of, say, our HTTPS traffic. And then also, once a certificate, once a um, compromise has happened, um, it's incredibly difficult to revocate that because of the way that our revocation system currently is. And Dane is perfect for fixing both of these issues. One, pinning on the DNS completely eliminates the need for a CA system. Um, you know, like I said, we can actually pin on an SSL cert. And now that we control, you know, our organization owns that uh, DNS server, we now own the security for, say, our HTTPS traffic. And then also, it handles uh, revocation really elegantly. And um, it's kind of a side effect that no one's really talking about right now, but it's, uh, I think, something that's really uh, good to be noted. Um, speaking of revocation, how are we doing revocation right now? And uh, really, there's two, two answers. There's uh, CRLs and OCSPs. Um, CRLs um, are basically a list that gets pushed out, set, you know, specifying you know, which SSL certs have been compromised or rolled out or no longer valid. And that's, it's too large. Um, you know, there's, there's no way it's scalable. It's a huge list. And it, so it's, because it's too large, they got to cut out like a bunch of them and it's not comprehensive. And also, if we don't get this list, we can't just shut down our CA checking system because like if you DDoS a CRL um, server, then it would just take down the entire internet or at least all secure internet. And then similarly, OCSP, this is more of a um, per uh, uh, receiving a CA signed cert. It, it checks to see if um, it's a valid certificate. And um, again, they've got issues with like, you're constantly going to OCSP servers to check for certificate uh, validation. And again, it's a fail open system. Um, so like I said, we're gonna talk about some Heartbleed here. So, um, you know, an interesting consequence of Heartbleed is that everybody thought that their CA uh, cert was, was um, compromised and then everybody wanted to revoke their uh, certificate and publish a new one. But there's, there's just really no way of handling this currently. Um, Adam Langley from Google basically specified that, uh, you know, Chrome uses a mixture of uh, CRL and OCSP and neither one of them can handle a revocation properly um, or, or um, significantly enough to revoke mass amounts of certificates. And Dane handles this really well. So say your, your, your um, certificate gets, com gets compromised. Well, now all you do is you know, create a new certificate, push it up to the HTTPS server or whatever server, and then simply um, update your DNS record with the um, signature of your new certificate. And now you have, you're pinning on a completely separate certificate, and if anybody uses that compromised cert to try and manually your connection, it won't be valid because the TLSA record type takes care of that. So, you know, yeah, we have these problems with the CA cert, but there's, there's also problems with, with the DNS server. So, you know, with their CA system, it's not really a, any longer a chain of trust, it's more of a web of trust, just because, you know, there's so many intermediary, intermediary CAs out there, 
and um, you know any one of them can get popped. Uh, whereas a DNS, um, a Dane um, DNS connection is more of a tree of trust. DNS sec, uh, you know, your either yours or your .com or your root has got to get compromised to compromise your DNS sec um, traffic. And um, so, and then there's there's some other issues with like you know with your CA system. We have multiple root um, trusted uh, CAs. Whereas this one only uses one, and that's the government. So that's really kind of a pro and a con, depending on how you look at that. Um, you know, the people that run those CAs are multinational uh, conglomerates. Um, you know, Symantec, Komodo, GoDaddy, GlobalSign, those are the big ones. Um, versus this one's going to be owned by IANA, and then the people that own those TLDs. Um, and then that's going to kind of change when we have all these generic TLDs coming out because now we're going to have a lot of different separate companies that are going to be, that are going to be able to publish um, DNSSEC validated records. So that's going to be something to watch out for. Um, and then protections in the SSL handshake, um, you know, at least with the CA system, it's all in one protocol, right? It's all in the SSL protocol, whereas now we're kind of breaking it out into a second protocol to handle this. So there's some introduction of some more attack surface by using two protocols instead of just one to validate our SSL traffic. And then, you know, something to look at is, you know, how many CAs have been compromised versus how many DNS servers have been compromised. And, you know, when, if we decide to move towards a more DNS-based uh, approach to security, uh, I definitely think that we're going to start seeing a lot more uh, DNS compromises, but there's already been some significant ones. Uh, just take a look at MS 11058, um, huge compromise in uh, IIS, uh, um, Microsoft's DNS. So luckily you don't have to choose though, because like I said with the certificate usage, we could actually pin not only using TLSA, but also using your CA, using certificate usage one which basically says this certificate has to be validated by PKIX, but it also has to be the certificate that we, valid, that we specify in this TLSA record type. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm starting to run out of time here, so I'm just going to jump over that. Um, so what, again, we have this issue with, with implementation, and this is going to be it's because it's a bootstrap protocol, right? So um, no one wants to implement Dane. No one wants to implement DNSSEC because um, it's a protocol that no one uses, and no one uses it because no one implements it. So there's kind of the chicken or egg situation, and um, you know, like I said, point three of .com uses DNSSEC, and like a handful of sites use Dane right now. Um, there's a really good tool out there called DNSSEC Validator that will actually you know um, check for TLSA records as and as well as DNSSEC. So uh, check that out if you're interested in actually using that for your client. Um, there's a couple of good sites that you can actually test that out on. Uh, I've got dane.tenantcargyle.com. That will be validate. That is validated by TLSA record types, as well as good.dane.verisignlabs.com. And also, if you want to check out if your validator is working, there's bad.dane.verisignlabs.com as well. So, um, one of the reasons I took a look at this was because of NCC uh, Domain Services. Uh, NCC is a parent company for ISEC Partners, and they're actually releasing this new TLD called .trust. And what it basically does is it requires that anybody in that TLD to get any, uh, regular um, penetration testing and um, they have to comply to a regular set of standards to be in the dot .trust uh, TLD. And one of those standards is that they have to be you know, using Dane and they have to be using DNSSEC. So um, I think this is a really great sign that you know, we're going to start seeing this a lot more. Um, there's a reason why um, people are talking about this a lot more. It might not be implemented yet, but it's good to just start talking about this and start, um, you know, looking at the security of this before it gets implemented. And kind of going with that, um, what can you do? I think there's three different ways of looking at what can you do if you actually believe in Dane or DNSSEC, and that's builders, breakers, or handshakers. Um, you know, if you're a builder, obviously, um, this kind of applies to you. Uh, you know, if you're a web, a web server maintainer, why not sign your zone with DNSSEC? Or if you're um, an application developer, why not build into your HTTPS stack uh, validation for, for Dane? Um, also, breakers. So um, this stuff definitely is going to need testing, right? So we're building new code 
It's using crypto, so it's probably going to use C or some uh, low native language code to um, write the validation for this date in DNSSEC. And we're going to start putting this in a lot of different clients if it picks off, if it picks up. So, um, and already we're kind of starting to see that um, a recent, uh, in 2013, there was actually an arbitrary remote code execution in um, GNU TLS uh, in their Dane validator. So uh, I think, um, you know, for people like me that get paid to just break things, I think we're going to see a lot of issues with breaking things in Dane and DNSSEC uh, for developers that aren't paying attention to this new code. And finally, handshakers. Um, you know, like I said, no one's adopting this right now. And it's going to take um, some pushing from uh, IT, pushing from or an organizational standpoint to, to finally get um, you know, Dane and DNSSEC into uh, Google, into um, you know, any of your Alexa top 25 or top 100. Um, you know, we need to start um, communicating with upper management that you know, this is why we need um, DNSSEC. And um, this is what it will provide for our organization. So I kind of rushed to that last bit because we were kind of running out of time. I want you guys to get, be able to get to um, lunch here. But uh, do you guys have any questions about what I just went over? Yes, we're not. Yeah, so I have two questions. Um, one, you mentioned a, a handful of people were using Dane. Um, do you know, like, close to the numbers, whatever, you had, like, the percentages for DNS? Um, like, we're talking maybe 10. I mean, okay. this, is, this is very low. I don't, I don't know how the exact number, but, like, it's enough to, to, to tally, you okay. know? <laughs> Cool. And then, uh, you know, I'm a huge advocate of SSL uh, pinning and stuff like that. Um, what are some of the hurdles to keep all of the signatures that you're keeping in the Dane server, the SSL certificates, up to date, right? So that when you actually do that SSL certificate pinning, um, that those are actually correct. Yeah, so um, that's, that's a big, like, uh, a lot of people like to complain about, well, you, you know, uh, there's some, some standards for, like, how long do you keep your, your zone signed for? Um, how often do you resign that kind of thing? And um, uh, in the RFC, they kind of specify using an HSM to be able to uh, hold your, your keys you know, off the server. And then you can use some sort of automated pooling of, of that aspect. But that's going to be more of an organizational decision. Um, but uh, kind of going with that is that um, Bind has now released a set of tools that really makes it really easy to like resign your zone and to do uh, uh, key rotation. So those solutions are becoming more um, more available. You know, the the, the larger that um, DNS second Dane get, uh, there's going to be more availability of that tools. But right now, it is kind of limited, and that's a big uh, uh, negative that a lot of people don't want to hassle with having to rotate another set of keys. Any other questions? Yes. At one point, Chrome has worked for Dane. Do you have any insight why? So, yeah, I kind of, I, 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 um, I mentioned uh, Adam Langley um, in this talk, and uh, he's got a pretty good post on that um, about, you know, why it was in Google and why they took it out. But really what it boiled down to was no one was using it. Um, you can actually get uh, forks of Chromium that still support it. Basically, they just took the comb, that code, put it in Chromium forks, and uh, you can use that. But um, that's, that's the reason why, uh, yeah, at least that's what Adam Langley says is the reason why they took it out of Chrome. Any other questions? All right, thanks, everybody, for coming out. I really appreciate it.